So hello everyone, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm Arno, I'm from ThinkCell, I'm one of the two founders and uh, we are a small software company in Berlin, we have about 30 people and we do software for automatic slide layout. And you can actually see the software outside on the screen in action. Um, we write our all our software in C++ and as part of that work we are building a larger and larger library of C++, kind of the, the standard library we would always like to have. And part of that library is um, doing also the, the range-based text formatting that I'm going to talk about today. Let me see whether that, that works. Great. Um, so, as I said, we're going to talk about text formatting, and of course that's a very, well, normal, old topic, right? Everyone is doing text formatting in some, play, in some way and has been done for a long, long time. And um, there are many different libraries for it. And here is another one from us. And of course, uh, you know the XKCD comic, right? If there are 14 competing standards, now we have 15. All right, so what's text formatting? Basically, with text formatting, you take components of text. Um, there may be literal text or strings, or there may be something that you want to turn into a string a number that you want to format. And you have the order of all these components, and you want to string them together into a, in a resulting string. And uh, you also maybe, for every one of these components, you have some parameters. You may have the number of decimal digits you want to add to the number, something like that. And at the end, what you get is the string. Easy enough. Um, so, the one way to describe the order of components and the, the, the arguments, the parameters that you are, you're, you're giving to these components to format them, um, one way to describe that is a format string. And you're all familiar with it, right? The plain old printf, you put into your string, you put all the, the annotations that tell you how to format a number, say. Um, and there are several libraries that actually use that kind of, um, that kind of uh, approach. One is uh, printf, of course, old C. Um, there's also a, the Google App Style library, um, pretty new. Um, they are also having a, a, a formatting tool that is compatible with printf. And um, there's also a new part of the standard coming out. They probably want to put it into the standard, uh, which is also doing uh, 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 text formatting more with the Python syntax, with curly braces. Um, but this is... The, 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 the part that they're going to put into the standard is strictly pre-ranges. And what we're going to talk about today is um, whether with ranges we can actually do better. But first of all, um, as an alternative to format strings, there is the way to describe the components of the text with what I would term just C++. Um, the C++ standard way of doing text formatting, I.O. streams, is using that. They're overloading the shift operator. Um, also, when you just concatenate strings with plus, that, that would also qualify as just using C++ to do text formatting. And uh, the std library has these very simple uh, functions to, to turn numbers into strings. They don't offer much in terms of formatting. Now, what are the advantages? Let's go through these two options. We have format strings and we have just C++. So let's go through these both and see what the pros and cons are and what we're going to pick. Um, first of all, why would we use format strings? Well, one good reason is that the syntax is closer to the string that you finally get. You are looking at a string, you have some placeholders into the string, so arguably you kind of can see if you squint your eyes what you are going to get at the very end. Um, a disadvantage that they, the format strings used to have is kind of going away. They, it used to be impossible to check at compile time if the format string is valid, but with now all these const expert support, it is actually possible to do that, um, to check the format string at compile time. Of course, you have the option, and that's special to format strings, to determine the string at runtime. And in that case, you can't do any compile time checks. Well, that's, that's okay. Um, now, what are the disadvantages of format strings? First of all, when you write the format string, you have a certain format in which you put in the placeholders that you cannot have in your literal text. So your literal text must be somehow escaped you have to pay attention that you, that you do this escaping and you don't inadvertently add some annotations, some placeholders that you don't really want to add. 
Um, it's also a bit weird that we kind of reinvent the wheel because the, the parameters that you were adding to these components are described in some sort of language. You have your curly braces and then you describe in, in, uh, in, inside of them how you, for example, how many decimal digits you want. And that's a language. And we already have a language. We already have C++. So it would be kind of natural to use the language we already have rather than invent another one. Um, this comes, it becomes in particularly cumbersome if you want to format user-defined types. So you made up your own type, you want to print it, and now you have to put a parser into your implementation that says, okay, how am I going to describe the parameters that, that or how am I going to write the parameters that describe how to format my, <clears throat> my user-defined type? So there you would have to kind of put in a parser, although maybe we can just use C++. What I don't like the most uh, about format strings is that they are, in their syntax, discontinuous. So concatenating strings is very natural to do without any format string. You write a string plus another string. That should be easy enough. You don't really need a format string for that. But now, when you want to add a number in between those two strings, suddenly the syntax changes entirely. You are going from the representation of just concatenating strings to a, a representation where you have a string and then you have your format uh, uh, specifier for, for the number and then another string. So you have to make that jump. And it may be very, very tempting not to do that, but to just say, well, I'm just going to format this little snippet in the middle um, with, with my, my, uh, my, my format tool uh, but otherwise still do just string concatenation. And, and these discontinuities are, I, I don't particularly like because they're also hard to teach. What am I going to tell people writing C++ at ThinkCell or in other places when to use what? It would be nice if we have a common tool that does everything. There is one area where format strings are indispensable. When you want to translate your program, into other languages. The way you usually do that is you write the program more or less in English, and uh, then you send the strings to a translation agency. Because, I mean, you may not have a Portuguese speaker in your company, and maybe he has other things to do than translating your program. So you, you collect all the strings, you send them off to the translation agency, and you get it back translated. And the way you do that is usually in form of strings. Uh, there's in particular an XML format that you use to actually communicate with these translation agencies. And uh, the strings may contain placeholders, right? So here, you, you cannot get away from format strings. You must use these placeholders, uh, otherwise you cannot communicate with your translation agency. That said, the translation agency is a, a third party sitting out there. You may not have complete control. You, you may not closely control what they are doing. You don't understand the language that they are translating it into. So you probably only want to give them as much control over your program as necessary. And the things that you are usually putting in to, to formatting parameters, number of decimal digits, or the way how you format dates, that has nothing, that, that's nothing that the format, that the, the translation agency should be able to mess with. So you, I want to decide the number of decimal digits based on if I'm printing yen, I don't have any decimal digits. If I'm printing euros, I have two decimal digits. That, that's not none of, of the translation agency's business. So in our experience, the only thing you really need when you communicate with these agencies are positional arguments, just the positions. Just you, they may want to swap two replacements in the text, that's still fine, that can happen in some languages, but they don't need any more than that. So you want to keep the, the format strings kind of stupid, and that's what we did. So let's talk about the other way to, we talked about format strings, let's talk about the other way, the just C++ way. Um, the, the first thing that people know when it comes to um, how to format strings in C++, of course, I.O. strings. I, I think no one is a real big fan of I.O. streams. They are darn ugly. Um, they, they abuse operators, operator overloading with the shift operator. Of course, they didn't have variadic templates back then, so maybe that was their only choice they had. Um, then 
what's, also, what's really awful about them is that they're stateful. So when you want to print a number with two decimal digits, you say uh, set precision to two. And then, that's a, that then, then the, 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 the stream got that state. So when, you, when, the, when the stream is passed around your program through different functions, then you're never really sure what that current state of that stream is. So either you do the inefficient way and reset always everything to just to be safe, or you have certain conventions and you rely on certain settings that the stream already has, but that can break very easily. Um, the, the last thing that, that makes I.O. streams pretty bad is that they're slow. The I.O. streams sit on top of these I.O. buffers, and the communication between the two happens through virtual calls. So per se, they, they can't be inlined uh, very easily, and, um, and that makes them not terribly fast. In addition, when the string is being created, it's being put into these I.O. buffers. And when you want the string out, it's copied again into the std string. It's actually it's, it's returned by value, so and there's no R value overload or anything. They, they are actually creating a copy. So you always have an extra copy when you're, when you're creating, when you're formatting a string, which is also pretty bad. Let's go to the last, uh, the last variation of, of how to do um, uh, text formatting, and that is uh, string concatenation. Now, string concatenation, arguably, it has an, another way of operator overloading abuse with a plus. Um, you have no formatting options, and it's also slow, because whenever you are concatenating strings, first you have to create the strings that you're concatenating. So you're creating a lot of temporary strings, you then append them to some other string, and then you throw the temporary string away. So it's pretty bad. But I think, conceptually, concatenating strings is quite nice. It's kind of does, it, it is the essence of text formatting. It, you first turn the data into a string snippet. That's a separate step. And then you concatenate all these string snippets. And extending it to your user-defined function is pretty easy. You simply write a function that you pass your user-defined type to that returns a string. So it could be easier. So I think the syntax is nice, how you write it. But the implementation is slow. And we are going to fix that now with ranges. So coming to ranges, who knows the range-based for loop? Hands up. OK, not everyone, but quite a few. All right. Who knows the ranges TS, the technical specification uh, that is finding its way through the standard committee? OK. Now, who knows Eric Niebler's range v3 library? Same people. OK, a few more hands go up. That's good. Um, who uses ranges already, every day, in everyday programming? OK. You should, you must. This will change dramatically the way you program. This is, this is, a, this is a game changer. We are, we are doing it everywhere and have been doing it for 10 years, and it's, it's fantastic. Okay, Do it. Uh, you can you pick up range v3, pick up our library, write your own library. I don't care, but use ranges. Um, anyone using boost range still? OK, that's likely going to die pretty soon. Anyone using our library? No. That's fine. Uh, homegrown library. No. All right. So what's the essence of ranges? We don't want these iterator pairs anymore. So instead of iterator pairs that you find throughout the library, we just put the iterator pairs into one object. And so instead of sit find, it begin, it end, we just write sit find range x. And that's actually already in range STS. Now, a range under this definition is anything that has a begin and an end. And that, contain, that, that, uh, that definition is is, uh, applies to containers. So you can use vectors, you can use strings, any, any of the containers you know. But you also have what the ranges world uh, talks about as views. And they are essentially referencing elements. They don't own elements, they reference elements. And you can imagine they are just your plain old iterator pairs. Iterators are pointing to elements as well. So these views are just pointing to elements, but they're a single object. 
Now, the interesting part about ranges that makes it so powerful is that these ranges can do lazy calculations. So you may have something like, and that's from our library that I'll, I'll give you the URL at the end. Uh, you can write TC filter, range, and a predicate. And that will actually just generate a little object, a little wrapper object, that captures the predicate and the range. It won't do any work. And when you actually then start iterating over that object, you can kind of use that object as a, as a container, then it will actually do the filtering. Which is nice, because if you only need the first element, you don't need to filter the whole container. You just go to the first element, and that's it. Now, why do I think I know something about ranges? Um, Thingsel has a range library. This is part of our general effort to make our pro programmers more productive. It evolved way back from boost range, and um, we have um, about a million lines of production code that uses these, this range library. And usually when you're developing a library, you have this chicken and egg problem. You, are, you don't know how to write the library until you have a lot of usage for the library. You are learning by having usage. But when you have a lot of usage, you can't change your library anymore because everyone is screaming that you change the library and yet they have to change their code. Oh my god. We avoid this problem by having, first of all, all the code that uses our library is in-house. And we have extra resources, people, dedicated to refactoring the code. So it's a typical thing that we have some great idea on how to improve the library, and we just say, hey, Han, can you just introduce that into our code base? And he uses whatever is good. He uses Clang Refactor or regular expressions or whatever you have to actually introduce that into our code base. And we do this again and again and again. And every time we do that, we think, okay, now we are done. You're not. You always learn, you always have something new, and, and it's, I, I think if you just try to say, okay, I'm gonna, gonna design a library on a, on a green field, and, and, and that's it, that's my, that's my great invention, and, and I think that's set in stone, it's never gonna work. You need to iterate, you need to have the ability to iterate if you wanna write a good library. Now, the first thing you're going to do when you are switching from using string functions to ranges for string processing is to replace all these member functions in basic string. So basic strings, okay, you can use them, but don't use their member functions anymore. There is no dot .find anymore in our code. All the index-based functions, they will go away in favor of iterators. So that, that has the advantage that you, are say, that you use the same algorithms, the same generic algorithms that you use for strings, also on your other sequences or other containers that you have in your, in your code. You have a uniform syntax for all of that. And you're also pretty flexible with strings. There are quite a few platforms that require you to use a certain string type. And what you can now do is you can wrap that string type into a range interface and use all the range algorithms with that string. So you are, you are suddenly no longer tied to, to using a basic string. So I really recommend doing that. Um, unfortunately, as it's so often with C++, there is something great and new, basic string view, that, well, that's actually already half deprecated again, because it contains exactly the same interface as basic string, by design, they wanted to drop in replacement for basic string, but it contains all these uh, member functions for basic string that I think you should not use anymore. So, other than that, basic string use is fine. Um, so, when we want to use ranges for text formatting, we already have quite a lot of ingredients already there. It's quite simple. So, all the range libraries have some sort of concatenation. You give it two ranges, and it concatenates the two ranges. And uh, the syntax in range v3 is actually quite similar. Here's the thing cell syntax. It's, it's tc concat for concatenation. Now to format data, you can now easily add formatting functions, like sdeck. Um, sdeck just takes, takes a number and takes a number of decimal digits. What I omitted here is maybe you also want to add the decimal separator that it uses, whether it uses dot or comma. Um, and then you put that, that, that formatter anywhere you put a range. So you can just concatenate everything together. Instead of a string, you have that as deck. And when you read that, just pretend it's a string. It's some sort of string. And we will look behind the scenes at the end what's really, what it really is. 
Now, this is unlike IO streams. You can't just plug in a double there. A double is not a string. A double is a single entity and it has a completely different type. And it, it becomes awfully confusing when all your, your ranges suddenly turn arbitrary types into ranges. You probably don't want to do that in your library. Um, as you notice, there's no need for a std format function. There's no special formatting function. You don't switch mode whether you are doing string concatenation or formatting. It all becomes one. Now, it also is very extensible because you can write simple functions that return ranges like this. So you just return the concat um, of SDEC and dollars, and it, it just becomes a new range that you can then use anywhere where you use ranges. All the range algorithms work. Um, all, all these things that we put together, the SDEC or the concatenated version that has the SDEC in the middle, you can run all your range algorithms. You can run it for each, you can run an all off and any off, and wh whatever you like, you can, you can, it, it will work. It's, it's a range. Now, eventually, you want to make sure that your text goes into some sort of container, a string usually. So how do we want to do that? Well, let's see what the standard library already gives us. Stit string, an empty constructor is an empty string. Okay, that will probably stay that way. A single parameter to for to stit string will just put that, that string that you passed into the string. So it's quite natural to say, hey, why doesn't that also work with ranges? Ranges are conceptually strings, so if you just pass a string, a, a range, as a parameter to the string constructor, it just just construct the string. Um, same with the concatenation. What we also want, maybe, is you don't write, have to write the concatenation anymore. So when you're pa passing something variadic to the string constructor, then the string, so, so zero arguments gives you an empty string. One argument gives you a string of that one argument. Well, by extension, two or n arguments give you these n arguments concatenated into the string. It's just a shorthand. If you don't like it, you don't have to use it. And you may say, hey, there are already, if you make this proposal, there are, there are already these very valuable multi-argument constructors for string. What about them? Let's look at them. Here are these very interesting constructors for string. What do they do? So the first one, it's undefined behavior, because it takes the first three elements of the string A, that has only has two, A and the null terminator, and puts it into the string. Okay, well, okay, that, that was a mistake. What about the second one? Ah, as you can clearly see, it puts 65 times control C into the string. That's, that's a very useful thing as well, right? Um, uh, yeah, and, and the last one then adds three times the A, as, as you would think. Add, just, just deprecate that stuff. It's, it's unreadable. I mean, instead, we can simply write this. We can simply specify first what kind of string would we like, and the string here is three times the A, and then put that into the string. So we are not losing a whole lot by um, deprecating these two argument constructors to string. Unfortunately, we can't simply change the standard. So for our library, we had to kind of pretend that we can change constructors. And we did this by introducing explicit cast. Explicit cast does all the, the explicit construction that we would like to be there, but that isn't in the standard. For example, it does things like when you are, when you are constructing a double from an, or an int from a double, it actually makes sure that the double is already an integer in our library. Uh, you have to specify how you want to round it, because simply rounding to zero is often not what you want. And um, so these kind of safety things are built into the explicit cast. But one way where we also use uh, the explicit cast is to simulate these string constructors that I, I talked about. Um, we also have a, an M place back that is using explicit cast as needed. So that's also kind of to, to simulate the, the in-place back that we don't have. So you can write things like you have a vector of strings and you can now in-place back another string as deck onto that vector of strings. 
so that it automatically gets converted into a string and appended to the vector. You also have append. Okay, that's not too exciting. You can append something to an existing string. And I also promised you placeholders, right? And here are our placeholders. The, um, the, the placeholders themselves only describe the position within the string. Everything else is at the end. It's just yet another string. You can put anything there. You can put your concat expression, whatever you want, uh, in, uh, as, instead of the s deck. Um, it's just a string, and the string just gets inserted into where the placeholder is. And you can also see here a little bit how it's going to be written, right? So it's a concat. There's also a, uh, a formatter that's an HTML escape. It also generates a range. This is, this is all just, just range stuff. We also have support for named arguments. If you, sometimes it's, it's helpful if you write a template uh, that, that people are not so, where people are not so familiar with the context in which it's being used to use, um, use named arguments. So there's also the format up for the ISO 8601 uh, date time. We also have that. So, how do we implement all that? The easiest way would be each one of the formatters returns a std string, and then the concat concatenates all the strings and returns a string, and then the append just appends strings. That's pretty boring. It's also, oh, it's, it's simple. Yeah, that's great. But it's, uh, first of all, it's slow because you have all these temporary strings, and, and the talk would be over. Right? So I want to tell you a bit more about how to do what, we, what I showed you efficiently. Actually, we were going to be very close to handwritten optimized code. First of all, what do we need to do? Avoid heap allocations for all these little subcomponents. Avoid all these temporaries. Um, we do this by generating the characters on the fly. So whenever you are, you are iterating over these formatters, they will spit out the characters, but they, they don't contain the formatted version of it. So the, and, and then the SDEC, or formatters like SDEC, they actually have sizes which are determined at compile time. You don't need any, any heap allocations. So when you have something like, like this here, the, the SDEC stores only the double itself and the, and the integer two, and the, the concat will actually store the components. So it will store the, the SDEC and a reference to the dollars. The, the concat actually stores components by value if you pass an R value, so things don't, don't uh, dangle. But if you pass an L value, it will just store a reference. And th that actually works very well in our code. It's a bit like expression templates. You kind of build this tree of objects, and when you actually want to generate the string, you iterate through your tree and, and spit out the characters. Now, how do we do that? Um, so in order to do this efficiently, you probably want to first determine the string length, then you want to allocate the memory, and then you want to write your characters. That's kind of the most efficient way to do it. So that's the first attempt. You just pass iterators to that range to the container, and it has a, con a constructor that takes two iterators. OK, that's fine. So let's try that. Now. The problem is, the formatters are not random access, so, or it's, it's hard to make them random access. It will cost you extra effort to make them random access. So what's going to happen here is that the constructor will actually run twice over that range. First, to determine the size, and then it will allocate the memory, and then it'll run over the, over the range again. To do this more efficiently, you can add a customization point. You say, OK, my ranges can support size. I can ask them for size. And if they implement size, and you have a few default cases for arrays and such, um, then I'm going to do it differently. I am going to first reserve the memory by the size of the range. And then I'm going to an, do an explicit iteration to avoid this double pass through our range and just m place back the characters. OK. Um, that, that gives us single pass if, if we implement size. Um, then we also have append. But hold on a minute. What about cont reserve in this context? The problem is cont reserve is, is evil. Reserve is evil. Reserve does not guarantee that the size of that string is incremented 
by a certain factor. It may just make it larger by as much as you tell it. So if you append the range that is size one and do that repeatedly, then your container is just going to be incremented one by one. And every time you increment it, it gets copied and reallocated and copied and reallocated and you become quadratic in your running time. That's pretty awful. So we wrapped ConPreserve and gave it the guarantee that the size of the container is always incremented by a constant factor. So you get a linear running time. Now, what are the next bottleneck? Iterators. Um, iterators actually cost you performance. So whenever you have a concat like here, then the iterator that uh, of this of this this uh, concatenation is either the is either the iterator of one component, the first component of the concat, or the second component. So whenever you do a dereferencing or an increment of that iterator, you actually have to to switch on the type of the iterator. So and, and, and you have to do this every time you access the iterator. Every time when you increment, when you, when you dereference, there is going to be a switch. That's not very efficient. As DAC, you similarly have, similar have, uh, have bookkeeping costs. Now, why, is this, why does this problem exist? C++ iterators do external iteration. So the consumer is at the bottom of the stack and is, is, is running along. And every time you, it wants a character, it just goes to the producer and say, hey, give me a character. The thing is, this is good for the consumer. It can write a continuous code path. But for the producer, it's pretty bad because the producer is, is surprised every time it gets the request for another, for another character. It needs to figure out, okay, what's my state? And then return you the character that, that, that it should. And you have to do this kind of state recovery every time you're called. It's much better if you turn this around. So it's much more natural that the formatter spits out the characters because the consumer is doing nothing else but appending it to the, uh, to the container. And it turns out that this internal iteration, where the consumer is at the bottom of the stack, the producer is at the top, they are actually, um, it's actually quite natural to add this to ranges, because many of the algorithms also work with internal iteration. Binary search and find don't, because they take iterators, but for each, accumulate, all of, none of, any of, they all work. Uh, and you can also write these lazy, these lazy ranges, filters, transforms. You can also write them with uh, internal iteration. So let's see whether we can extend ranges to internal iteration. The way we do that is the range is implementing operator parentheses. So usually it implements begin and end, but we will make it in addition implement operator parentheses. And you pass a sync to that, uh, to that function call operator, and it will actually plug all the elements one by one into that function. So this is a range. It just, it's a range of one and two, which is called sync with one and then sync with two. And the visitor, by means of the for each, is just going to get plugged into the range, and it receives the values. Now, stit span already overloads operator parentheses. We have to sphena it out. You have to say, oh, no, no, this is not the operator parentheses we want. Um, but other than that, it has a big advantage that we can write these things as lambdas, which is very practical. We do this everywhere in the code. And the for each is kind of the glue. It, um, if you give it some, uh, some range that only has iterators, it'll do the iteration with the iterators. But if it has an operator parentheses, that range, it'll use it. Now you can write the concat without any overhead. You simply call for each of the ranges you do it for each, which also works on tuples in our library. You call that, and for each of these ranges, you just run an individual for each. That's probably how you would do it when you write handwritten code. You, if you have three ranges, you want to iterate over one, over the, one after the other, you just call it one after the other. Now, in order to use that for appending to strings, we add a um, appender customization point. And the... Um, the way this works, so, so you, you, are, you, are, uh, you have a customization point appender, and for every container, you can actually generate that functor that appends to this container. And by default, they look like this. It's a simple end place back. 
but you can customize. You can, you can, if, if you like something else better, you can write your own appender for your, your perfect container type. Um, okay, what about reserve? Now, the sync, right now the sync gets the characters one by one, right? But it needs actually the range, the whole range, to determine the size of the range. So we add another customization point um, that we call chunk, which is a, a range. So it, it basically the, 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 the consumer advertises, hey, I want the whole range, please. And if it, if it gets that range, it can actually do the reserve, like it did before. And then it will, here we just strip off the, the chunk part. This is derives from the standard appender. We just strip that off and call for each again. So we've done, the, we've done the reserve. We don't need to do the reserve anymore. Now we can do the standard implementation for append, which is just uh, the end place back. You may, think, well, you, may, you may think, well, this chunk sounds like awfully like a very special thing that we just came up with, and uh, well, it's just for a very, very special purpose to do the reserve. Well, not so. If you, for example, have a file sync, you want to write a range into a file, file operations usually take memory chunks. So the chunk can actually advertise, it can only, it can only take pointer ranges. It can only take chunks of, of ranges that appear in chunks, like vectors and arrays, that can, it, can, it can write in one go into a file. And you can just do an overload here with std span that, that says that. that says, I'm, I'm a range that, that takes, or that I'm a consumer that takes ranges of memory blocks. And then you just write a single F write. Now, what about performance? Where are we? Um, we have this very um, simple handwritten um, appender, which just takes three characters and their counts, and I wrote just loops to write this into a buffer. That's the, that's the stupidest possible buffer. Um, no end check, no nothing. It's just right to the end of a, of, a, of a pointer. So this is the, basically the fastest way you can probably do that. There's no memory allocation, there's no end check, there's nothing. Just right to the end of the pointer. And as an alternative, we use it with our infra we, we do it with our infrastructure. You have a repeat n, and you fill the buffer that way. And, and there is this appender here. So we invoke all our infrastructure and, and write into that buffer with our infrastructure. So what's the difference between the two? It turns out if repeat n is iterator-based, we have about 50% worse than the handwritten code. If um, I add the operator parentheses to the repeat n, so we are we do eternal iteration, we are only about 10% worse than the handwritten, the handwritten code. So we're getting very, very close. And this is, this is basically the, the, the formatter here doesn't do any work. It just repeats a character. This is as stupid as it can get. If it would actually do work, the, the, the difference would go down because you would spend more time doing the actual work of the formatter. Here is uh, the last performance comparison I have. Um, I built a ba toy basic string implementation. And I'm doing the same thing again with uh, adding 10 times A, 10 times B, 10 times C. And first with a regular, with a regular appender. And the regular appender checks for the end right there. So every time you're doing this end place back, then it will actually check, have I reached the end of the container? Do I need to reallocate? But we already reallocated. So ideally, I would like to do this. If I am reserved, if I reserved already the memory, I know I don't need to check for the end. I'm, I'm, I already know that I, don't, I can't overrun my buffer. So it turns out, if I omit that check, I can actually get 20% better. I, I save 20% time. So this is, this is an interesting um, approach by, by actually customizing the appender, we can, we can gain speed. Uh, problem is, of course, it requires the vector to allow this, this uninitialized adding of characters. So, so we, we, where we, it doesn't check for the end. Like, trust me, I, I know where your buffer ends, I'm just gonna write it, uh, to, to plain memory. We don't have that, but maybe in our library we could build it. There are other things where you could improve performance. Uh, for example, not everyone may be able to implement size. 
but instead you could implement min size. So some could say, I'm at least that long. You can already allocate the memory for that long. And if we are longer, okay, maybe you have to reallocate once or twice, but, but the, 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 some, some bulk of the reallocation is already done. So that, that would actually save additional time. You could also do um, something like determining the maximum size, because if you're writing to a file buffer and you expose that, that buffering mechanism that the file system usually is doing, that the, 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 the I.O. system is usually doing, then you can say, hmm, my file buffer still has 347 bytes left. If you are no larger than 347 bytes, I allow you just to just write plain memory like we did with a, with the, with a, string, a custom string implementation. And only if you're larger, then we really have to watch out. Then I have to start checking whether you don't overrun the end and, and flush the disk in between. All right, and that's the end of my talk. Um, I showed you that you can use the range syntax and the algorithms for text formatting. And uh, for performance, you need a few new customization points. Range, the, you need the, the internal iteration, you need appenders, and you need the, the chunk um, customization point. And then your performance is competitive with handwritten code. Here's the URL for the library. And of course, if you want to help extending the library, we are also hiring. And uh, now I take questions. Thank you. Thank you for a good talk. Uh, can you give me a point of view how you deal with problem when capturing by reference the L values of string, where, which might be uh, changed in future, but you kept the reference and you have uh, different points when you catch it and then you get the value? Um, the library is built on practice, on what are the problems we really have? Now, so range v3 does it differently. They say, I'm allowing inside ranges only L value references. So there, this would actually have the same problem. Um, range v3 ignores the problem that you are bringing up. We also ignore that problem. Um, but we are allowing capturing of our values as, as values, which is very important. If you don't do that, the ranges are not very practical because you, are, you want to generate things as temporaries and then put them into ranges. And you don't want to have to jiggle multiple objects around which all reference each other and you have to move them somehow. It's going to be very difficult. So answer to your question, we ignore the problem. It's not a problem. We haven't seen it to be a problem in practice. Because usually you put together these ranges and then you consume them rather quickly. You don't keep them around forever. Um, the range, the, the R valueness is critical, and there we have the experience that the R value capturing things by value that are R values works well. It does kind of it it, it doesn't you, you we don't run into memory um, corruption problems very often. It's it's it works very well. So I think so. The question is really uh, the uh, the answer is really ignore the problem. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, uh, ah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, could you, uh, could you uh, talk more about performance of the C uh, placeholder function? Because uh, it's, uh, uh, on, on, from my point of view, it's uh, not more performance uh, than uh, other uh, functions like format in Python style. Compared to Python style, uh, do you mean do you mean the, the performance of the of the placeholder yes, function? Yes, uh, at the beginning of your talk, uh, you uh, talk about translation agency and uh, mm -hmm. uh, most uh, applicable function of uh, from your library. It's a uh, TC uh, uh, TC placeholder for translate. When? Y yes, I right. Right, correct. But uh, how about performance of this? this I, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't really know. I haven't measured. Um, my suspicion would be, I mean, you do what you need to do, 
right? So you are the, the way this works is that it looks for a placeholder, and then it gives the, the, the first part of the, of the chunk as one for each. There, all these chunk optimizations will kick in. So if you want to write it into a file, this will be one continuous chunk. And then, then the placeholder gets taken, it gets, gets, gets parsed, and it will basically just call or, or refer to the range that you pass to it. So it will just be as efficient as the range that you passed as an argument. There's, there's no, not a whole lot of difference there. Um, and then again, you have a chunk. So really, the, the, the placeholder string gets divided up. You have the cost of parsing it, yes, uh, but it gets divided up into chunks, either of constant strings, and then they're as efficient as constant strings are, or they are these ranges that you pass to them, and, and it depends on how they are implemented. So it's all just recursion. It it's just goes into whatever Im implementation you have for these parts of your, of your placeholder string. Um, there, there's nothing magic about it. It's, it's, the, the, the placeholders are very dumb, as I said already. Uh, you talked about uh, runtime performance, but what about compile time performance of this library? Um, I must say, I don't know. Um, we, so so we, can still, we can still compile our program. That's good. Um, my, my, um, my take on it is... Um, it's, pr it's probably something that is implementa heavily implementation dependent, but our goal should be, or, or my goal from the, from, from, from the ThinkSell point of view, for me always the idea was, okay, how can I get my syntax, my, my w the way I express myself, how can I get that right? And once I got that right, I can see how I can make that make the compiler do that faster. So it, it's, I don't think we are at the point yet where we make compromises with the syntax just to to make it easier for the compiler. That's that, that's not. Maybe the library could be optimized with respect to uh, to compile time performance. Um, that's that's possible. I I wouldn't know. But this, but the, the main goal in, in overall in the library and, and what we are doing at ThinkCell is how do you want to write it? How do you make the programmer productive? Um, how do you make it make you, the, your code expressive, self-explanatory, and that, that and, and at the same time allow efficient compilation, keep make make it possible to optimize it. I mean, you can you can always write Python. But if you have every, everything is a hash map, there's just no way that you're going to make this efficient. And, and our, our goal is always, given that you have a good inliner and given that you have, have uh, a good optimizer, that you are getting close to handwritten code. That, that's the general goal of C++, and that's, I guess, the goal of the library as well. But I don't know the compile time performance. I have a question. Uh, regarding your example with uh, concatenating three series of the same characters, uh, can, do you, did you compare it uh, against uh, not so naive implementation using MEMSET, for example, or other factorization technique? Um, no, um, because I... The, 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 the memset um, optimization would be very much dependent on just doing repeat n, right? Um, so what I wanted to do is to compare it against something that is that would also be applicable in other situations. So if you repeat n is very uninteresting, that is just a straw man. What you really want to measure is say as deck or or some more interesting formatter. But with, with SDEC, there is a certain component of performance that depends on how well you implemented your SDEC. I mean, at the end, it will, it, will have, it will spit out individual characters still. But how do you get to these characters may very well depend on the implementation. And I didn't want to measure that. So that's why I did this repeat N straw man, because it actually spits out individual characters, but the actual work to generate the characters is trivial. Um, that's why it was a good comparison for me Rather, the, the mem, maybe the mem copy would be, or mem set would actually be faster because it does some internal optimization. Um, speaking of, I mean, 
speaking of which, I think the compiler should be able to to do this with these very trivial loops if you if you just um, if you just write fill memory with from a from a string uh, from a from a pointer. Um, but I don't know. For me, it was fair enough that it's it's comparable to other formatters, and 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 it it will exaggerate the portion that I spent on my framework. That was important. So I'm not going to lose more than 10 percent, even if I if, if I do other algorithms. Okay, I think I get the sign. We need to finish. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll be sticking around for a few minutes if you have questions. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for listening.